one study where we looked at a panel of blood metabolites recently. We had about 900 different panelites. The vegans, as compared to our non-vegetarians, all of them Adventists, differed in 600 of those 900 uh, to a significant extent. So you could make the claim that the, the fluids that bathe the cells of vegans have a different composition the Californian Adventists, and we compared them to the Californian non-Adventists. And there we found on average that the Adventist men were living about seven years longer and the women about four and a half years longer. If we took an Adventist, for instance, who was vegetarian, uh, ate moderate quantities of nuts, had never been a smoker, was careful about their body weight, uh, exercised vigorously three or four times a week, that's when you got to that 10 to 12 years more uh, for that kind of a very highly observant Adventist as compared to the non-Adventists in California. In today's episode, I sit down with Professor Gary Fraser. Gary is a cardiologist and leading nutrition scientist with a three plus decade interest in how nutrition affects the health of Seventh-day Adventists, a particular denomination of Christianity. If you've heard of the Blue Zones, then the Seventh-day Adventists and the town Loma Linda is likely familiar. Gary and his colleagues are the ones formally studying this population of long-lived people. In this episode, you'll hear from Gary on how omnivores, pescatarians, vegetarians, and vegans fare with regards to lifespan and risk of particular chronic diseases. We talk about the common criticisms thrown at the Adventist studies, whether the church influences the research, how Gary separates religion and science, how vegetarian and vegan diets affect fertility, soon to be published research on diet and cognition, and plenty more. Enjoy. You're a distinguished professor at Loma Linda University and a cardiologist. What, what is a distinguished professor? What does that actually mean? <laughs> Well, that's a good question that um, I don't, I'm not sure I know the uh, answer to exactly, but there's about 20 of us out of 800 professors, if that gives you some idea. And uh, I imagine it has something to do with uh, publications, research, uh, dollars that we've brought into the university, uh, teaching experience, that, that type of thing. And so you're splitting your time across cardiology and acting as a cardiologist clinically and then the research that you're doing in Loma Linda? Yeah, so I've actually done that uh, really for 30 or 40 years. And I've found it, it's a good mix because many times the real life experience you have in working with people inform your research and the questions that you can ask and uh, even ways that you choose to answer them actually. Yeah. So how would you describe that, your career as a scientist? What are those questions that you've been interested in, in exploring? I was brought up a, a vegetarian in New Zealand, and so I've always had an interest in diet and lifestyle in general. Uh, when I was a young doctor, it became pretty clear to me that I um, was quite interested in prevention because even though clinical medicine is very interesting and continues to, to interest me a lot, uh, it is true that many times once disease is in place, you can never fully reverse it. And there's a great deal to be said for prevention. So I was interested in um, uh, chronic disease, but I was interested in mathematics at the same time. And it seemed like a good way to combine those two was epidemiology. So um, I quickly became interested in uh, mathematical statistics and ways of investigating how lifestyle uh, influences uh, your health over the, uh, um, over the lifespan, really. Uh, mainly looking at chronic diseases, cancer and heart disease, life expectancy, those, those kind of things. And you did your PhD in New Zealand and then moved to, to Loma Linda? Yes. Okay. Mm -hmm. And it's in Loma Linda where, what, for the last couple of decades? Or how long have you been spending time in Loma Linda researching and, and observing the Seventh-day Adventists? Uh, for 44 years. Mm -hmm. What does it mean to you to be, to be a scientist? What does that actually mean? 
To be a scientist is to try and be objective, uh, I think. Uh, science is actually a very hard thing to define, as I've discovered recently trying to write about that, and philosophers have spent a lot of time trying to define it. But, uh, you know, the essence of it is that we never ever feel that we've necessarily discovered the absolute truth, and certainly in nutrition science that's the case. But rather, we take the best evidence we have to hand, we have ideas in our head, and we try and test them. We actually try and falsify them. And if you can't falsify them, they are the given truth for the moment, but at the same time, there's a recognition that in two or three years' time, it might change. Hopefully not a lot, but uh, almost certainly things continue to progress and to, to morph, uh, you know, that's how science is. And a lot of people don't realize that. Science, uh, in many people's mind, is kind of a black and white truth. But uh, most times it's, it's not that way, particularly in the behavioral sciences like uh, nutrition and lifestyle. Right. So that mm. objectivity that you speak to is very much reliant on a willingness to be wrong, which requires humility. Uh, yes, uh, although we kind of almost expect to be wrong mm -hmm. because the ideas that you have and start off with, um, you very quickly get knocked into shape if you think that you're never going to get proven wrong because, in fact, the testing you do is really aimed at detecting wrongness. Uh, that's what um, hypothesis testing is doing. Um, do any of your hypotheses kind of come to mind that perhaps you've proven wrong or you know, you've seen new data, whether it's your own or others, and, and had to change your view on things over the years? Well, I mean, one that comes to mind is not so much my own research, but it was what I was taught as a, um, a young doctor, is that, uh, for instance, better blocker drugs um, 30 or 40 years ago were considered kind of like poison for people that had congestive heart failure. Uh, but for the last 25 or 30 years, we've known that exactly the opposite is true. Uh, you have to apply them carefully, but there's, there was a complete paradigm change, if you like, in terms of how we thought of congestive heart failure. And anything related to nutrition with the, with the Adventists that has maybe surprised you? I don't think that before we tested it, I had much expectation or understanding as to how life expectancy might be impacted by lifestyle. Um, and it was a surprise to me to find as we published, and it's caught a lot of people's uh, imagination, I guess, that we measure the life expectancy of a fairly... Um, conservative, if you like, uh, Adventist, um, in terms of many years longer than their non-Adventist neighbors. And um, that, that, that was a, a big surprise. Um, mm. What do you think gets in the way of a scientist changing their view? Do you have any words of advice, I guess, for a young budding scientist that, that wants to have a career that is really built on this foundation of objectivity? Well, I think that one of the things that inevitably happens, those ideas you have, the hypotheses that you set out to test, you usually have some level of conviction mm -hmm. before you look at the data that they're the right way to go. And um, I think you've always had to have to keep in mind that a hypothesis is just that. And it's something that uh, is often going to be disproven or partially disproven. Um, I, another example that I can think of is that actually our data, we were the first in the early 1990s to come up with the idea that nut consumption seems to be somewhat protective against risk of heart attack. And uh, subsequently, uh, our data uh, that seemed to show that uh, has been confirmed by a number of other studies uh, ar around the world. But nuts are a fatty food. Nutritionists at the time and dietitians were saying, hey, they have lots of salt, they, they're fats, and therefore they've got to be bad. But it turned out the, uh, the, with uh, you know, a certain amount of care, the opposite is true. Yeah, I've, I've copped a little bit of heat, I guess, from uh, 
being a, a strong advocate for the consumption of nuts, there is a, a still a, a very passionate, uh, which I love, community out there that promotes a very low-fat, total low-fat vegan diet. Are you of the view that a high, higher fat with a focus on healthy fats is better for cardiovascular yeah. health? Yeah, no, very, very much so. And um, I did my um, postdoctoral fellowship at the University of Minnesota which is uh, quite a famous place and for many reasons, but one is that there were a, tri a trio of scientists there back in the 50s and 60s, Drs. Key, Anderson, and Grande, who did a, a series of really um, you know, studies that changed the way that people thought about fats. Uh, because saturated fat, they very clearly showed raised serum cholesterol, but polyunsaturated fat, and to a lesser extent, monounsaturated fat, appeared to, to lower it, or at least was completely neutral. So the idea very came uh, very clearly came that not all fats were equal, and that uh, therefore a very low fat diet was probably not the way to go, even though that was the, the wisdom of the time, really. Right. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, the keys mm. equation was born from That's that, right. from that yeah. research, um, which still holds mm. true to this day, it does. even though that's what, 50 years or more right. ago. Mm. Nutrition can be a pretty heated and divisive topic. How have you managed to kind of keep your cool and remain sane um, amongst that controversy and the kind of fighting that you can see, you know, mostly in the media and, and on social media? Well, I've, I, I think I've tried to ignore a lot of that. Um, I think my background in uh, mathematical statistics and uh, also the methods of epidemiology have really helped me a lot to uh, try and evaluate studies. And the kind of studies that we do are, are very difficult. Uh, they're, they're some of the hardest studies that one can imagine because think, think of this. Nutrition, if you want to study foods in their relation to chronic disease, how many thousands of foods do people eat? Uh, so first of all, how are you going to document what people eat without a lot of error? Because can people really remember what they have eaten over the last year? Well, only in a very approximate way. So there are big issues with measurement error in diet. And then there are all kinds of other issues with what we call confounding. We think we're measuring one variable, but because we've forgotten to put another variable in the model that happens to be closely related to the variable that we're really interested in, the two get confused. And uh, so there's a question, one of uh, perhaps how we determine which population we're going to study how we can measure their diets with accuracy, and then having done that, how do we try and pass out what are the important factors in their diet that, that are actually making a difference? All right. I want to put a pin in healthy user bias and make sure we cover that when, when we get to, I guess, some of the common criticisms that are, that are out there when, when people are talking about the Adventist studies, and that is one of them, You know, this idea that, well, these healthy food behaviors associate and go hand in hand with more exercise or less smoking or less alcohol consumption. So let's make sure we, we come back to that. Yeah, good point. It sounds yeah. like from what I'm hearing from you is that a lot of that disagreement on social media and in the mainstream media is because you can literally just find a study to support anything. And unless you understand statistics to some degree, understand methodology and how to review that, understand how to interpret the results, then you can come to an erroneous conclusion or you can just find a conclusion that kind of supports whatever view you already have. Yeah, it's, it's a very tough science and um, it's very hard for the average layman to figure out what's real and what's not. And I mean, one of the things um, I suggest to people is that when you read books, uh, as you can pick up on the airport stands and so forth, uh, be much more impressed by an author who is actually an active researcher himself. 
Uh, there's many people that have MDs and PhDs that see fit to write a book. But if you don't find their name attached to peer-reviewed publications that relate to nutrition, be very cautious. Mm -hmm. mm. One of the things I'm always trying to remind myself and get better at is just remaining very open-minded. It's easy to see some data that maybe challenges a view that you hold and just discard it uh, immediately. Do you have any any tips for looking at data that is challenging your beliefs? How can we go about doing that in a way where our bias isn't getting in the way of, of how we interpret that? Yeah, it's interesting. I mean, I, I think it's kind of true that there are at least three things which almost are at the core of a person's being. One is their politics, and the second is their religion, and the third is how they eat. And I think all those things are very, very hard to change. And um, so, you know, I grew up in a particular religious community, and we're studying that community. Uh, and so we have to be very careful that we don't let our, the way we were brought up, I would not say necessarily beliefs, but the way that we were brought up and have been led to think was the right way to do things, we don't get that in the way of the data. Um, it turns out our data is complex enough that it would be very difficult to make it try and prove something that it was uh, truly not uh, consistent with. Um, so, uh, you know, I, I think that you've got to have a point of view as a scientist that you're not being what people sometimes call apologetic, setting out to prove what you want the data to say, but to let the data say what it will. Mm -hmm. A lot of people have strong views on food and, and nutrition science that aren't involved in the science itself. It's different to many other areas of science. So if, if you or I were talking about um, space, for example, um, you know, we would probably put our hand up and say, look, <laughs> I'm not an expert in that. Let's, let's ask an, an astronaut or, or, or someone. But when it comes to food, probably because it's something we all do three times a day, we feel that we're entitled to have a very strong view of the science. Yeah, no, that's exactly right. And I think you've you know, hit the nail on the head. I mean, when you come to smoking, for instance, it's much easier in some ways to investigate that because there's a lot of people that don't smoke, but we all eat. And uh, it's kind of part of our persona, the way that we've been brought up to eat. And uh, it's not necessarily that we've been taught it's right, but uh, it's what feels good. And to, to change that is not easy. I had Walter Willett on the show last in the last six months or so. Very popular episode. Of course, a very um, you know esteemed scientist that's greatly respected within the nutrition science community, and I think the most published scientist out there. I look at his career, and I look at your career, and I know you've published some some work together, and you're in your your friends or colleagues, and. I can't help but draw some parallels. You know, he spent a lot of time uh, working um, in the space, I guess, of epidemiology. These observational studies, looking at um, trying to answer questions about how does food affect long-term health outcomes, and his focus on the nurses' health studies cohorts and health study or health professionals follow-up study. It's always a mouthful to get that one, um, but yours on different populations, the Adventist cohorts. And it, it had me wondering this morning, how similar are your views when it comes to, to, to food and, and what is a healthy diet to, to someone like Walter Willett? I think they're almost identical. Um, we have had, over the years had a number of conversations and he has actually been a consultant on our uh, study. So um, I think there would be very little between us when it came to these views. Uh, I mean, we both have studied populations of convenience, if you like, but they nevertheless are large populations of people that have the same physiology and biochemistry and probably genetics as anyone else. 
Uh, he's been interested in the health professionals and nurses because they're likely to be compliant um, more than others, and indeed that's been the case. Um, I found the idea of studying Adventists uh, very appealing, uh, mainly for this uh, reason that a lot of people don't understand, and that is that the Adventist Church recommends a plant-based diet but does not mandate it. And so there's only about half of Adventists are vegetarians in the way that we define it in the United States. And so that actually sets up a rather wonderful natural experiment that we decided to take advantage of. In other words, we could compare people who were all Adventists, but some of them lived their lives in different ways that potentially we could try and establish whether that had an impact on the health experience uh, going forward. Is it is it just the the diet that differs among those people, and they otherwise have a very similar lifestyle? Is that what makes this a, a rather unique population to study, or do those differences in diet also associate with differences in physical activity and smoking and that sort of thing? Um, only only to a very limited sense, and you know we've had the ability to actually test it out because our study, our current study of ninety six thousand Adventists, has about Half of them are vegetarians and half of them not. So we can actually address the question you've just asked. And the differences are pretty minor when it comes to physical activity. Um, and, so, and of course, Adventists don't smoke cigarettes. That's true of both groups, the vegetarians and non-vegetarians. Uh, use very little alcohol. The non-vegetarians will use a little bit more, but even they, by you know popular experience, will be very, very low consumers and relatively uncommon. So it's one of the big advantages we have that there, even though it's not a randomized study, you can't do that. And we may want to discuss that more, but you can't do that to look at the kind of things we're looking at. But it's a natural experiment where we can have different groups of people who are relatively similar in other respects, apart from the one that we're focusing on. And in fact, even those other things, we measure them and we can adjust for the minor differences. So we, uh, I think we do a pretty right. good job. To try and see mm -hmm. more clearly the independent effect that food choices have on certain long-term health right. outcomes. Correct. Uh, just remind people, why, why is a randomized controlled trial not a possible kind of study designed to look at the things that you're interested in? Uh, for a couple of reasons. Uh, one is to change people's diet is a tough thing to do. And to be sure you've done it right, that means you've got to keep on measuring it. The second thing is that for many chronic diseases, it takes a number of years for them to develop and for the impact of a changed diet to manifest itself. So it is true that for heart disease, you can probably start to detect changes after two or three years. So there have been two or three only randomized studies that have looked at outcomes of heart disease. But for cancer, that's taking 10 or 20 years to develop. I mean, think of the impossibility of taking a group of people who agree to be either randomized to become a vegetarian for 20 years or not, or to be a meat eater. I mean, uh, it's just not possible to do that. And so we've got to work with what we call observational studies, where we look at people who who for various reasons live their life as they will, and then try and adjust for other factors that might be tending to confuse it. But at least cigarette smoking and alcohol is not an issue um, in our population. Yeah. Okay, and in the population you're studying, the Seventh-day Adventists, are they all based in, in Loma Linda? And am I correct, there's three cohorts currently? Uh, they, they are all run from Loma Linda University. Um, Historically, there are three large cohorts. The first two were just Adventists in California, and the uh, current one is Adventists across the United States and also some from Canada. So, um, you know, Loma Linda is, quotes a blue zone. It's a little bit of a misnomer. Uh, the study that was based on was the second of these cohorts, and in fact, it relates to the health experience of Adventists around California. Mm-hmm. Okay, so there's the AHS, AHS-2, which is this, 
the study you're talking about. Right. And right. then AHS3, that's the most recent cohort? Um, no, not quite. The, the first one was called the Adventist Mortality Study, began in 1958. Um, and then there was HS1 that began about 1978, and then uh, HS2, which uh, began ni- 2001. Mm-hmm. Um, and is there an AHS3? Did I hear something about that? Uh, no, okay. not, not as yet. Uh, we have a few things on the drawing board, but uh, right. okay. Yeah. Quick one, folks. I get asked all the time about buying supplements and getting blood tests. The good news is I've created comprehensive and completely free guides for both. Simply head over to my website, theproof.com, to download them. That's theproof.com. Okay, let's get back to the episode. The the population itself it lives significantly longer than the average American, even the the non-vegetarians that are within this population. Compared to the average American, would it be fair to say that even the non-vegetarians that are in the Adventist population are eating a quote, quote unquote, more plant-based diet? Yeah, very much so. The um, non-vegetarians are a health-conscious population by and large. I mean, I sometimes say tongue in cheek, cheek that I'm very grateful for the obese hamburger eating, non-exercising Adventists. We couldn't do our work unless we had these kind of contrasts. But in fact, people like that are few and far between. So uh, one of the problems that we face really in our study is that the contrast we have between our vegetarians and non-vegetarians vegetarians, is not a great one, but it's there. And it's somewhat surprising that we find the differences that we do. Uh, For instance, one study where we looked at a panel of blood metabolites recently, we had about 900 different uh, metabolites, uh, a whole uh, panel of them, that the vegans, as compared to our non-vegetarians, all of them Adventists, differed in 600 of those 900 uh, to a significant extent. So, you know, um, you could make the claim that the, the fluids that bathe the cells of vegans have a different composition to those of non-Adventist, uh, non-vegetarians. Oh, sorry, Adventist non-vegetarians. And do you think yeah. those differences in metabolites, mm. do they help explain some of the differences that you might see in sort of cardiometabolic outcomes or cancer outcomes? Uh, I'm sure they do. And it's, it's one of the challenges we have to understand what those 600 metabolites mean. But it does... I uh, give a lie to the idea that we're measuring diet so badly that we think we're measuring vegetarians and non-vegetarians, but we're actually measuring random error. Something's going on here. Um, so Adventists overall are enjoying more years of life than the average American. How, how many years? Has that been quantified? Uh, not exactly. We haven't looked at that. We recently published a study where we uh, took our whole Adventist group and compared them to a U.S. census population. Uh, Actually, the U.S. uh, census uh, department did the analysis for us, and we found that the Adventist group, on average, was uh, had about 35% less mortality. What that means in any one year of life, that about 35% fewer of the Adventists were dying as compared to their non-Adventist neighbors, if you like. Uh, so that would have translated to X years of extra life. Um, I would guess it would be in the range of four or five, but we haven't actually done that particular analysis. Mm. Yeah, I've heard some people quote this statistic that Adventists tend to live 10 years longer than the average American. So that that's not a statistic that you've seen kind of supported by any particular study. Well, that, that, that goes back. Um, yes, it is, really. That goes back to an analysis we did on AHS-1 uh, that related to the Californian Adventists, and we compared them to the Californian non-Adventists. And there we found, on average, that the Adventist men were living about seven years longer and the women about four and a half years longer. And this was hugely statistically significant. It was based on thousands of deaths, as you you might uh, imagine. So it wasn't a chance finding. But then we looked a little deeper and we asked, well, there's different kinds of Adventists, you know, where we've talked about that. Some of them are much more adherent than others. And um, 
if we took an Adventist, for instance, who um, was vegetarian, uh, ate moderate quantities of nuts, had never been a smoker, was careful about their body weight, uh, exercised vigorously three or four times a week, that's when you got to that 10 to 12 years more uh, for that kind of a very highly observant Adventist as compared to the non-Adventist in California. Right, so we're talking mm -hmm. about the difference being you know, mid to late 70s to kind of mid to late 80s instead. That's correct. And that's, that's mm -hmm. lifespan. Mm -hmm. um, sometimes when the conversation focuses on lifespan, we can overlook the benefits of health span and how many years of someone's life are they affected by chronic disease that can be... Uh, debilitating uh, affect quality of life considerably so do you have a sense of that in terms of are the adventists compressing the number of years where they have chronic disease chronic disease uh not exactly but we did um compare a quality of life index in fact there's two indices one measures mental quality of life and the other physical quality of life and compared the uh, that that metric to U.S. norms and looked at it in their 40s, 50s, 60s, and 70s. I think that was all that was available to us. And all of those years, the Adventist men and women, blacks and whites, actually, uh, were above the norms uh, for every decade of, of life. So as you just kind of mentioned, it would be surprising if we weren't getting good quality of life because the kind of things that interfere with quality of life uh, are some of the things that turns out we're not avoiding, we're delaying them. Uh, and so uh, I think uh, in that way, looking at those quality of life indices for both physical and mental quality of life we did appear to be do doing better. So not only longer, but better. Has there been um, any investigation as to whether there is a difference in mental and physical quality of life within the different groups in the Adventist cohort? So whether someone follows a non-vegetarian diet or a vegetarian diet? No, we haven't, we haven't looked at that. Um, what about comparison to other religious groups? I see people sometimes comparing the Adventists to the Mormons and saying, you know, they're, they, they seem to be just as healthy, they have different dietary preferences, you know, where they actually overlap is the fact that they abstain from smoking and drinking alcohol and live a, a healthy lifestyle otherwise. Uh, how, how do the Adventists compare to it? Other, other religious groups? Yeah. Um, you know, we really have never done a proper head-to-head -head comparison that, that I'm aware of. Uh, it is true that other, you know, more conservative uh, groups who um, probably even are a little bit more conservative in their dietary habits as well uh, probably do a little better. Um, it is interesting how religions can uh, kind of get into this. I spent a few weeks in Romania a few years ago and was invited into the home of um, an Orthodox uh, Catholic there. And it turns out they spend about a quarter of their, their year being um, vegetarian, in fact, vegan, strict vegetarians, and they call it a fast. A fast in, in that setting doesn't mean no food. It means becoming a vegan. Um, and no doubt they um, gain some advantage from that. But uh, no, to, to your question, I'm not aware of any really well done head head comparisons uh, comparing us to other religions. Um, yeah. What about kind of quantifying you know, how much of that increase in lifespan compared to the standard American is driven by body fat? So B BMI or body fat percentage. You know, I had Professor Roy Taylor on recently. I'm not sure if you're familiar with his work, but he does a lot of research on type 2 diabetes. And he spoke of this idea of energy toxicity. So people um, putting on fat and then based on genetics, we have a kind of different threshold uh, by which we can store fat 
subcutaneously and at different points depending on the individual when fat starts to begin to get stored in the liver and in the pancreas we can see these metabolic conditions like type 2 diabetes or non-alcoholic fatty liver disease and that kind of got me thinking i think 70 percent of american adults are either overweight or obese and i was curious what's What's the Adventist population look like? What what percentage of them are overweight and obese, and and how much do we think their body weight is determining, influencing these you know better health outcomes that we see? Yeah. Um, well, the um, it's very interesting to compare vegans, which are those that eat no animal products at all, and are about ten percent of our group. Lacto over vegetarians, people who eat dairy and eggs but no flesh foods, pesco vegetarians, those that eat fish but no other flesh foods and are otherwise like lacto over vegetarians, and non vegetarians. And it turns out if you look at BMI, that our vegans, our strict vegetarians, are averaging about 23.8, where 25 starts to be called overweight. Uh, our PESCOs and lacto-ovos are right up around averaging about 25, which means that about half of them are actually overweight, half of them are not. And our non-vegetarians, their BMI is averaging about 28. Uh, even though, as you pointed out, they're really only eating flesh foods about three, three and a half times a week. So they're a pretty health conscious population, but they're Americans, I'm afraid. And we eat too much in terms of portion size, um, and make choices even amongst vegetable foods, vegetarian foods, which are not ideal sometimes, uh, a lot of processed uh, foods. Um, in terms of to what extent body fat makes a difference, or BMI, we in the same paper that we analyzed that those extra 7 to 12 years of life we just talked about, we f did find that there were five factors we could identify that each roughly contributed potentially about two years of extra life. And uh, they were actually some I mentioned before, uh, being a vegetarian or not, um, being careful with your body weight, which was another, um, vigorous activity, physical activity, small quantities of nuts, and never having been a smoker. Roughly speaking, each of those independently contribute about two years of life. So as an independent factor, the BMI seemed to be in that two years range, but it's kind of tied up, isn't it, with being a vegetarian or not? Because it turns out that vegetarians have a, a lot to do with whether they're overweight or not, whether you're a vegetarian. Uh, it's tied up with physical activity. So these things, it's a little hard to dissect them out, but having to look for an independent effect of body weight, uh, we seem to be looking at about two years. Mm -hmm. and, and the kind of reverse of what you're saying there is that that analysis allows you to look at the independent effect of a vegetarian diet on mortality minus its influence on body weight. And nut consumption. And nut consumption. That's right. When you yeah. say small quantities of nut right. consumption, what does that mean? A uh, small handful. Right. Do you have a go to a go to nut that you enjoy most, or you like the nutritional properties oh, yeah, of yeah, most? So, so you know, to, just to be clear, we're certainly not talking about having a bucket of nuts in front of the TV. Um, but uh, yeah, I mean, nuts are actually a great food because you can put them, you can use them in so many ways in your diet. I actually choose to sprinkle mine on my cereal in the morning, but you can put them in salads, you can put them in a variety of entrees. Uh, so, you know, you can use them in so many ways, actually. Um, very flexible. Yeah. yeah. My go-tos mm. tend to be walnuts and macadamias. Right. And um, they, uh, or, most of the nuts are not botanically related, actually. I think pecans and walnut are an exception to that. But um, walnuts have a lot of polyunsaturated fat, and they also have a moderate amount of omega-3, linolenic acid. So they're a bit different to the others. Uh, most of the others are high in monounsaturated fat, including peanuts, which of course are botanically uh, uh, a legume. 
but they seem to have a lot of the same nutritional qualities uh, as other nuts, actually. And is it the monounsaturated fats or the polyunsaturated fats or both that you think are beneficial from a cardiovascular point of view? Probably, probably more so the mono, the uh, polyunsaturated fats in the sense that they lower cholesterol. The uh, monounsaturated fat is largely oleic acid, and it seems to be more neutral, but it's certainly better if you substitute it for saturated fat, you see. Um, you mentioned yeah. that there's mm. this kind of stepwise increase in BMI as you go from a vegan to a lacto-ovo vegetarian to a pesco vegetarian to a semi-vegetarian to a, to a non-vegetarian. And one of the things that kind of comes to mind is that you know, BMI can also be heavily influenced by muscle mass. And some people might be curious as to whether there's been any attempt at looking at this cohort and seeing, is that increase in BMI because, you know, as people are eating more animal foods, they have more body fat, or is it because they have uh, more muscle mass, more bone mass, etc.? cetera? Um, we've actually got some data on that. We got some uh, body composition um data using bioimpedance, but we've never really looked at it. We've never had a chance. It was only on a subgroup of our population, so we don't have an answer to that. Um, but I don't think there's any evidence that animal foods tend to increase muscle mass. Um, yeah, I think there's, there's a, a group out there who would argue that a vegan diet being lower in protein and say calcium might lead to increased risk of sarcopenia or low bone mineral density. These might be the limitations of such a dietary framework that people might point out and say these are things that you would want to be aware of. Um, and that that combination of reduced muscle mass and uh, lower uh, bone mineral density, and I'm not saying that that's been confirmed in your population, but this is the view that I think someone would table right now would would increase frailty and risk of of fracture. Have those outcomes been looked at? Uh, yes, they have, and I, I think there is some increased risk of um, lower bone density in very strict vegetarians. Um, but we've looked at that, and it turns out that the best ways to avoid osteoporosis, and it's not only our data, uh, really have not a lot to do with calcium, for instance, unless you're really calcium deficient, which the vegans are not. You can get all kinds of calcium from uh, vegetarian foods. Uh, I mean, we've looked at it. We've got data on it. The vegetarians are not calcium deficient at all. Uh, they tend not to be much pro lower in protein either because, I mean, there's no shortage of ways of getting protein uh, with a vegan diet. It's not just lettuce, leaves, and carrots, you know. It's um, nuts and legumes and whole grains. And uh, the population as a whole probably gets more protein than they need. Um, so the, the idea that vegans... Uh, suffer from sarcopenia, I don't know that our data would support that. Um, we don't see that, and we have the largest study of vegans in the world. I mean, uh, the other thing, that there are actually two items that our data suggested were preventive of osteoporosis and bone fractures. Uh, one was regular vigorous physical activity which has nothing to do with diet or being a vegan. The other was getting adequate protein. And interestingly, we were able to look at that separately in the vegetarians and the non-vegetarians. And either way, it was effective. In other words, animal protein and vegetable protein had the same apparent impact in terms of being associated with uh, you know, bone fractures. So... Um, uh, you know, I I guess I haven't seen the convincing evidence about uh, what you're saying. What is the um, the mm. protein intake within the Adventist cohort, and how does how much does it differ between the vegans and the non vegetarians? Very little, actually. Um, I mean, it's 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 in the seventy gram range, which is you know well within uh, what's generally considered to be sufficient, and uh, very little. So that yeah. would 
fall kind of just above one gram per kilogram probably based on the average body weight i'm assuming yes. of yeah, of, of, of these yeah. people um yeah there's a there's a, an interesting meta-analysis by tengawa i think it is i'll put it into the show notes for people to look at but it speaks to what you just said then but this was looking at how does increasing protein consumption affect strength in two different contexts one is without physical activity and one is with physical activity and when you look at without physical activity it really doesn't do much at all you can increase your protein intake if if the stimulus isn't there the body's not adapting i think most people um can can understand and comprehend that the other context where there is physical activity what was interesting was most of the increase in strength comes with about 1.1 1.2 grams of protein per kilogram which is probably not far off where the adventists are at and so you know online and in media you'll see a lot of focus on protein and consuming high protein but that going from where the average protein intake is today to say high was like squeezing the last few drops out of the of the towel when it came to strength um which says to me that if we look at sarcopenia today just across the united states and you look at the average protein intake i would argue that most of the the loss of muscle mass and quality is because people are sedentary and the stimulus isn't there it's you know if if they had that stimulus there they have more than enough protein to to adapt and to to stay strong as they're aging yeah no i i think i'd agree with you uh, wholeheartedly there and uh, you know one, one of the i think kind of myths that's around is that as you get older you should have packed on a few more pounds um, and uh, our data doesn't support that uh, the other word in other words the idea that people that have once they get into their 70s and 80s that have a little higher BMI, for instance, which is probably not protein mass, uh, I mean muscle mass, but, um, but our data doesn't support that. Uh, we find that having a BMI in the 23, 25 range for both men and for women gives you the lowest mortality at all ages, right through to, to the old ages. And the, you know, the, there's a possible reason for that that is a little complex, but it turns out that um, in most average populations, and to some extent in the Adventist population too, but probably less so, people that are in that average range of BMI, kind of around the 25, as they get older, uh, many times people who used to be much higher, 28, 30, but because they've got chronic disease, have slipped back to be 25. So using that as a reference point has now become confounded and confused, whereas with the Adventists who are in that middle range or even a little bit lighter, they're often then not because of chronic disease, because of the way that they've uh, lived their life. So, so our data for both, interestingly, in black subjects and white subjects separately gives uh, really, um, I think, the light of that, that it's not really true. But there's a sweet spot between 23 and 25. So going too low is also not, not conducive to lower mortality. And there was, a, there was a, a, a finding in one of your studies. I wanted to ask you about this. I was speaking with uh, Dr. Matthew Nagra, who's been on the show, that um is is very across your research it's it's a 2014 paper i think it was the vegetarian dietary patterns and mortality in adventist health study too so a very well widely cited paper and in that in that analysis uh, vegetarians had significantly less uh, lower risk of all cause mortality than non vegetarians what I found interesting was that vegans, when they were looked at male and females together, it was almost significant, but it, but it wasn't. But then when you looked at males and females separately, the males did, male vegans did have significantly less risk of premature death. 
during that study follow-up period, but the females didn't. And then I read a little further and I saw that you, once you adjusted for BMI, then vegans combined, there was lower all-cause mortality. And I was wondering how we interpret that. Is it possible that the women or the female vegans, there was a uh, a number of them that were possibly underweight, which was you know driving the non significant finding that you saw before adjusting for BMI. Yeah, um, that, that's possible, and we haven't uh, you know looked specifically at that, but it certainly raises that question. But I'll just point out that in our newer study, um, and um, 2014, that might have been a preliminary paper even from our newer study, but uh, a later update, interestingly, does not place being a vegan in the, as the, the best choice. Um, and I think even in that paper, you'll find that the group that did best of all were the pesco vegetarians. Um, then the lactose did nearly as well, and then the vegans. Um, and our neuroanalysis really confirms that. We're not finding that the vegan, either men or women, are doing significantly better than the non-vegetarians. Now, these are all Adventists, so that's the non-vegetarians, remember, are still a health-conscious group. Um, but we're finding that the PESCOs and the lactos seem to do, be doing best of all. Having said that, the men do continue to do better than the women as uh, vegetarians. Uh, interestingly, in the black subjects, of which we have about 26,000, their, their vegans, and particularly the vegan men and women actually, seem to be doing much better. It seems to be a better choice for uh, black subjects, but not necessarily the best choice for, for uh, white subjects. That's interesting. So yeah. how does that inform the advice that you would give someone or and perhaps the, the advice that you would give yourself and your own food choices and, and what might explain why pescatarians and lacto-over vegetarians are doing significantly better than non-vegetarians, but the vegans are not? Yeah, well, I, that, that turns out to be a very complicated question, a very interesting one that we're still in the middle of. Uh, we've published a couple of papers in the last two years which uh, are somewhat relevant to this but can only explain a little part of it. And that is in our data at least, we find that dairy consumption, particularly dairy milk, is an adverse risk factor for both breast cancer in women and prostate cancer in men, which are the two commonest cancers in the, in the United States for men and women respectively, uh, apart from skin cancer. Um, and so, you know, that's potentially a big deal. And we're talking about, um, interestingly, you know, almost milk seeming to be a little pharmacologic, that you see the risks starting to rise at very small doses, a few teaspoons a day, but chronically over many years. Of milk or all dairy? Particularly milk. Uh, we didn't see an adverse signal for cheese or, or yogurt, at least not convincing. And it kind of seems to top out at about two thirds to three quarters of a cup a day, as if some perhaps metabolic pathway is getting saturated or something like that. The risk stays high, but doesn't much rise much higher than that. What do you and, think explains the fact that you saw that for milk, but not cheese or yogurt? Is it fermentation? Is it just differences in the nutritional properties? Yeah, uh, we, we don't know for sure what's going on here, but it is interesting, uh, at least one way that we could explain that is that dairy products do contain some bovine sex hormones. And both of these cancers, prostate and breast cancer, are the two most common hormone responsive cancers that we know. So it's hard not to think that might, something might be going on there. Uh, and it turns out that the process of making cheese and yogurt, if you look at the data, 
the uh, sex hormones, the estrogens and so forth in there that from bovine sources are less in those, in those uh, dairy uh, foods. So, so, I mean, back to the original question, why I mention this is that when you look at the difference between vegans and, say, lacto-ovos or non-vegetarians, uh, the thing that stands out is the absence of dairy in the vegans. Now, it turns out there's many other things too, because the vegans put other things in the place of that dairy, and so they have more soy, and they have more vegetables, and a variety of other things. But certainly it drew our attention to dairy. And so that's why we looked at that, because we observed that the vegans had lower risk of breast cancer and lower risk of prostate cancer, whereas the other kinds of vegetarians had no difference from the non-vegetarian Adventists. So we wonder what was different about the vegans. Obviously, dairy. Right. But and isn't we, that counterintuitive mm-hmm. in, in some ways? Because if we step back, what you were saying earlier was the lacto over vegetarians and pesco vegetarians, they're the ones that had, there was a significant reduction in total mortality. But you right. didn't find that for the for the vegans. Right. But then you find this association between dairy and prostate and breast cancer. But despite their consumption of dairy, their living yep. significantly longer. So is it, yep. that, you know, that's how why else is dairy affecting health that, That's outcomes? why I said it was complicated. And there, there's another little piece to this uh, argument as well. And that is that when we look in colorectal cancer, we found in our data the same kind of thing that many other cohorts had found, and which is generally accepted as probably true now, that dairy there appears to be somewhat protective. Uh, and out of data, data, when we dug a little deeper, we found that it was probably the calcium in dairy because we find that calcium from non-dairy sources seems to be protective as well. So we think that partly that could be why the vegans are not doing as well. But the other things that uh, we're starting to wonder about also, and this gets to some data which I can't really talk about too much because it's not published yet, it's just going to press. We find that particularly the vegans and perhaps the lacto-ovos who are nearly vegans, and many of the lacto-ovos have a low dairy, so they're not far from vegans, we're finding in our data a significantly increased risk of some neurological outcomes. And we, um, I wouldn't say that's an established finding yet and uh, it needs to go through peer review, but it's starting to concern us a little bit. And we don't understand why, but one of the issues that obviously comes to mind is that when you think of some of the longer chain fatty acids like DHA and EPA, it's the vegans and the lactose who are getting none of that in their diet, zero. Right, these important Uh, omega-3s for for brain function physiology. Well, that's right. I mean, um, there's uh, a significant amount of brain weight is actually DHA, is the most common fatty acid in the brain, and the brain's a fatty organ. Um, So this could be important. Now, that's not the end of the story, of course, because there is a conversion process from a medium chain omega-3 called linolenic acid to DHA. Um, And uh, there's controversy about that, but it's possible that the conversion of that, which is relatively small, but is nevertheless sufficient for good brain health. Um, And one other piece of this puzzle is that the possible increase we're seeing in the vegans and some of the lacto-vegetarians of these neurological issues is only in the very old people. And it turns out there seems to be a difference between when you're in your 80s or late 70s and when you're in your 50s and 60s. So it all gets very, very complicated. But that is obviously counterbalancing some of the impact that we see of the benefits of a vegan 
and a, and a conservative lactose over vegetarian on cardiovascular disease, on infectious disease, on chronic renal failure, and things of that sort. That's super interesting. Mm. Yeah. Uh, so that is suggesting that you know you rightly point out there's this debate: can you convert enough uh, ALA into DHA and, and EPA? Can you eat enough walnuts and flax and chia and get enough DHA yeah. And, yeah. and EPA? What you're saying is there is emerging data. This hasn't been published yet. That mu- that is suggesting that people who adopt a strict vegan diet or close to have higher risk of neurological conditions later in life. That's what our data seems to be suggesting. And in terms of that conversion process from the medium chain to the longer chain, uh, there is competition in the enzymes in the liver that make that conversion between the omega-3 and the omega-6, and perhaps the omega-9, which is the oleic, the monounsaturated fat. So it turns out that just having a lot of omega-3 linolenic in your diet, which the vegans do, uh, comes from walnut and flax and um, uh, soy uh, particularly, is not quite enough. Because if at the same time they're having a lot of omega-6, which they do, that competes and and uh, diminishes that conversion from the linolenic through to the DHA. So uh, it turns out that actually flaxseed is uh, the very best of all that I'm aware of in terms of that omega-6, omega-3 ratio. Right. So what you're saying is that your DHA and EPA status it could be very much dictated by the overall makeup or quality of your dietary pattern. And if you're consuming a lot of omega-6s, this is something I had a a previous guest, uh, Professor Philip Calder, who researches omega-3s and 6s, he spoke to this exactly. Um, If you're eating a lot of, say, omega-6 rich seed oils or ultra-processed foods with a lot of omega-6s, that might be using up a lot of those enzymes that desaturate and elongate the the omega-3s to DHA and EPA. And so you might have less conversion, end up with less DHA and EPA, and as a result, be at higher risk of some of these neurological right. conditions. And, you know, it's interesting when you think of where, where does all this omega-6 come from? Uh, I mean, a lot of it comes from very heavily processed vegetarian foods like, you know, soft margarines which we have actually advocated for, for many years. But, uh, I mean, the omega-6 that's in the corn and the safflower and some of the others, it's actually there in relatively small quantities. They, they've had to heavily process it to, to get that. So, I mean, to go back to a question you, you mentioned before, what would I recommend as the uh, best diet and what do I try to do? It's actually, um, I think, to put all the evidence together at the moment, it leads you to a low dairy, um, lacto ovo vegetarian diet that still allows some cheese and yogurt, but supplements with vitamin B12, and we haven't talked about that, particularly as you get older, and uh, definitely if you're a vegan. Um, but also, I think potentially includes modest quantities of fish. Uh, and as you get older, maybe supplementation with, um, with a DHA EPA, and, or and being sure that you have a uh, omega six, omega three ratio, which is around four. Um, so it all gets a little complicated, but in terms of, you know, just simply explaining it is a relatively low dairy, lacto over vegetarian diet with some fish, supplementing with B12, and maybe some flaxseed. <laughs> okay, I have a bunch of questions to dig a little deeper on this stuff. Uh, has there been any inquiry into how vegans in this population do if, they're, if they are supplementing with DHA and EPA? I'm not sure if there is a significant number or if that's data that you've collected. And also, we haven't covered this, but how long, on average, have the subjects in this in these studies adopted their particular right. diet? Right. Um, no. Well, I mean, this is relatively new data for us, and we do have data on supplementation uh, for all of our ninety six thousand people with fish oils. So, uh, you know, potentially we can look at 
those who supplement and those who don't, um, even if they're vegans. We simply haven't done that yet. Uh, as far as how long people have adhered to their, this is, I think, one big advantage that the Adventist population gives us. Uh, and that is, and we've published this data, on average, the lacto-over-vegetarians and the non-vegetarians have been that for 30 plus years, most of their life. Um, the vegans, somewhat less, but on average in excess of 10 years, uh, and the same for the pesco vegetarians. And I think this is a big advantage because, you, you know, it's a pretty common experience that particularly young people, they will give the vegetarian diet a go for a few years. And uh, so, it, but then often they, they lapse. And uh, it's a problem with other studies of vegetarians. And uh, we collaborate with uh, some, there's not many around the world that oftentimes the vegetarians they happen to pick up at the time that they begin their study are temporary vegetarians, uh, whereas in our population that's not the case in general. But, mm. Do you think there's this potential circumstance where it's possible to kind of over-extrapolate or over-interpret, say, results from your study um, looking at vegetarians and vegans with regards to recommending such a diet for say someone like me aged in my 30s you know if i eat a plant exclusive diet for my life that could look like you know 40 50 years of of doing that which we just don't have the data on that so could it be that you know say risks of fracture or sarcopenia are not being borne out in the data because people have just not consumed the diet for long enough i know that's probably a concern that um people from from different sort of diet tribes might might flag well i uh, you know i think our data a gives a little bit of the light to that because particularly the lacto ovo which is the most common form of vegetarian diet in the Adventist population and also the non-vegetarian groups the majority of those have been that way lifelong um so um, the, the other thing we're finding, interestingly, is that for cardiovascular disease only, not for cancer and for other causes of death, it seems like the impact of the vegetarian diet is particularly evident through the 30s, 40s, 50s, and 60s, but wanes in the 70s and 80s. Um, so if you've survived through to the 70s and 80s, being a vegetarian matters less as compared to being a non-vegetarian for cardiovascular disease. Not true for cancer and for, for other forms of death. So it seems like for cardiovascular disease, it's particularly premature deaths that, that we're avoiding. Um, so, uh, you know, yeah, if you're in your 30s and 40s and 50s, I think that's the right time. Um, mm. Just to double click on omega-3s a little bit more here. So... Your recommendation based on the data now, well, I mean, it's not perfect data, but there is data there to suggest that a direct source of DHA and EPA is probably a good precautionary approach. And that could be from consuming fatty fish, modest amounts, or supplementing. Do we have reason to believe that a DHA EPA supplement would bring about the same effect on health outcomes as fatty fish? Yeah, it's a good question. The, the The data, I think, is very not very clear on that. And in fact, it's not too clear yet whether supplementation does make a difference to, to neurologic outcomes. The data is very mixed, although there's sufficient out there now that did seem to show an effect that I think means that we've got to take it fairly seriously. But the, as far as I'm aware, the comparison between fish and supplementing the long chains, or for that matter, making sure you have only a good quantity of the medium chain omega-3 and not too much omega-6, I mean, that's another option that in theory could work. Yeah. And, um, yeah. So yeah. there's a few mm -hmm. kind of mm -hmm. ways to potentially get there, and you can of course go and measure an omega three index. Right. You know, there's companies mm -hmm. that I'm not affiliated with at all, like Omega Quant in, in America, that make it 
reasonably accessible, maybe not accessible to everyone, but it's it's an option. I think it's about $40 to, to do a test and they send it out. I've done it. Hey friends, are you ready to take your fermented food game and gut health to the next level? Look no further than my digital guide, Plant-Based Ferments. Inside, you'll discover some of my favorite recipes, including my soy labne and homemade kombucha. Visit theproof.com forward slash ferments for more details. That's theproof.com forward slash ferments. Okay, that's enough from me. Let's get back to the episode. Coming back to Seventh Day Adventists and, and the religion, you mentioned at the beginning, it's relatively conservative. I think it's a denomination of Christianity, but I don't know a lot about it. So maybe you can enlighten me, enlighten us. What is what is Seventh-day Adventism? What Tell us about the church, the, the history, you know, when it was founded, and, and why there is this uh, message within the, the religion to steer more towards a, a vegetarian way of of eating. So, so Adventism is an American religion, was first officially um, founded in 1863 in the East Coast of the United States. There were some very influential founders of whom one was a woman called Ellen White, who um, the believers at that time and herself felt that she had some prophetic gifts and uh, was also uh, a very prolific writer and author. And she wrote many things of a strict religious nature, books, many books, uh, which are still available and uh, avidly read by Adventists. But also she, right from the beginning, had an emphasis on health and uh, particularly lifestyle. And the rationale for that was simply that we honored God by looking after our physical bodies and our our mental mental personas as well. Uh, So Adventists have always had this emphasis, but it would not be there if it wasn't for the fact that we all always had the understanding from over the last 150 years that this way of living was more healthful, uh, even though you know people will recognize that this was far before there was any kind of much science going on in the way that we would understand it today. So since that time, the, the church had a, certainly an evangelical bent. It very quickly had an international focus. And uh, today, to make a long story short, um, there are about 22 million adherents who would call themselves uh, Adventists. And uh, one of the um, main features that people recognize uh, about the church is that the adherents are recommended to be vegetarian or uh, have a plant-based diet, shall we say, um, but it is not actually mandated. So people do that to a varying degree, which sets up this rather wonderful epidemiologic experiment that I talked about. Other features of the church, in many ways, the beliefs are fairly traditional Protestant kind of beliefs. Uh, but one obvious exception is that we adhere to the Jewish Sabbath, which is uh, Saturday, and tend to take that fairly seriously and make it a day of quotes, rest, and by that we really mean uh, withdrawal from the regular activities of the week, uh, the working week. So hence the the seven in Seventh Day Adventist, that's what that stands for. Exactly. That day of kind of just relaxation, is that the right word? Yes, well, uh, it's a day of uh, typically church life in the morning and uh, more relaxation. Often people will go for walks and hikes and things like that or socialize with, uh, with friends in the afternoon. Yeah. You mentioned there that the, the rationale uh, for the kind of lifestyle that Ellen White and others would put forward as a Seventh-day Adventist kind of lifestyle was health. I've read a number of, of blogs and I want to know if this is a conspiracy <laughs> or, or not, that have a different take on that. And there's a, a lot of 
writing about Ellen White and uh, Dr. John Harvey Kellogg. And I'm sure you've heard this before. And I want to bring it up because I know a number of other people probably read these blogs. And I've never spoken to a Seventh-day Adventist uh, or a scientist that's researching them. So I think this is quite a a unique um, situation that we find ourselves in here. There's this um, story, um, whether it's reality or conspiracy, I don't know, that um, John Harvey Kellogg um, thought that it was you know, a sin to have a sex drive and to masturbate and um, in order to help dampen the, the kind of sex drive of the population, you know, he would be um, manufacturing or producing these plant-based foods, which would then have an effect on on hormones and help you abstain from masturbation and, and sex. Is there any truth to that? Have you read any of his writing or looked back at the, the kind of history on that? Um, no, that that's news to me. Um John Harvey Kellogg was a very influential church member in the late 19th century, but actually separated from the church, I believe around about 1904 or 5, um, and really has not had any significant influence in the church's understandings or beliefs uh, for you know a lot much more than a hundred years uh, now. Now, having said that, he was a smart guy. He was very influential. Uh, he uh, put together a huge place in Battle Creek, Michigan, called the Battle Creek Sanitarium. That after he left the church, actually, most of that happened. Although he had some smaller institutions beforehand, and so he was a very innovative guy. I've been to a museum in Battle Creek, and some of the contrivances he put together, which supposedly were good for constipation and uh, electric shocks and all kinds of things, were quite amazing. But he was a scientist, but he was a scientist of his day, and he did some things that, to our modern minds, appear to be crazy. Uh, in terms of the sex drive and masturbation, Alan White, who is much, much more influential than John Harvey Cog ever was in the church, did not dwell on that. Uh, she had, I think, one of her very first books long before the church was officially organized that had some things to say about some of those things. But I can't recall ever reading in her writings that she equated those kind of uh, um, uh, kind of ideas with diet. So uh, I think that indeed is a more of a conspiracy than a fact. Is there any reason to believe that the plant-based dietary patterns that Adventists are following is having a positive, a neutral, or negative effect on uh, reproductive capacity on sex hormones on fertility i know there's one study i sent you that people like to point to that looked at semen quality in in vegan uh, men who presented to an infertility clinic in loma linda i believe Um, what do you make of i guess the overall body of literature looking at plant-based dietary patterns and its effect on fertility and sex hormones well we have studied that in only a minor way but we did not find major differences in fertility. And uh, certainly uh, Adventists, and having lived in that community for all of my life, really, have uh, there's never been any thoughts or writings or attitudes that suspect that uh, you know, fertility is a problem uh, with, within the group. Um, in terms of that one publication that you refer to, there was only five vegans and 26 lacto vegetarians. They were, after all, men that came to a fertility clinic to suggest that that small number and was in any way fairly representative of all the vegans and, uh, and non-vegetarian Adventists or pesco-vegetarian Adventists in the community who did not have fertility problems, I think is... Um, a big, big stretch. Plus, um, as you pointed out also, that there are other actually much better studies that show 
precisely the opposite. So uh, I think that the evidence for that just simply doesn't exist. Yeah, um, there's there's yeah. a uh, yeah. relatively yeah. small but important study looking at vegans and uh, omnivores, university-aged men. Yes. These were not men that presented with infertility and looking right. at sperm right. parameters. And I'm not an expert on sperm parameters, although I'd like to get someone on the show that can perhaps help educate me. But uh, mo these things like motility and uh, concentration seem to be better at least in that study in the vegan men so there's kind of data uh, on the opposite side and then there was a meta-analysis that i sent you recently i'll put that into the show notes too that seemed to suggest there was no difference in semen parameters between vegetarians and non-vegetarians that's right and i mean the, the the way you select populations is hugely important and even in the fertility clinic if you uh, if you read that first study carefully only 50% of the men that were invited to participate participated. So who knows what were the characteristics of the men who agreed to participate. To say that they represent any of those groups, I think, is uh, frankly nonsense. <laughs> that's the context that's lost when a study like this is presented on social media. You know, in the first instance, you don't get the context of what are the limitations and strengths of this particular study. What does it tell us? What does it not tell us? And then also the context of how does it sit or fit within the broader body of literature uh, looking at this. And we spoke earlier about being a scientist and being objective and how you form your views. And I assume you would agree that reproducibility is a very important component of that. Yes. And, um, you, you know, how you select your population is so important. The biases that can creep in if you, uh, for instance, have a group of people that don't truly represent the group you're trying to uh, can just change things completely. And another point in this first study is that only 50% of those that were invited agreed to participate. So, uh, you know, to think that that 50% represent a group fairly is uh, actually just nonsense. Mm -hmm. Yeah, by now people can probably hear that chopper or whatever is flying over the top of us here in <laughs> in los angeles but i guess that adds to this immersive experience mm -hmm. uh continuing on with this story the the battle creek sanitarium company that that uh, dr john harvey kellogg founded or was a part of uh i think there's some discussion online or claims online that people make uh, some of this seems to be factual, some not, that Sanitarium, which is a very big company and um, you know sells a number of products in Australia and, and New Zealand, I grew up eating wheat bix for example, um, that this is a kind of plant-based vegetarian company wholly owned by the Seventh-day Adventists. And so it brings about this question as to whether there is a a kind of bias that exists and could be influencing research on the Adventists in order to then benefit um, them in a commercial sense. So I wonder, I guess, just broadly, if you have any views on that, and then perhaps we can double click on how these studies are funded. Well, it's an interesting question. And um, of course, Simon, both you and I come from that part of the world, and my dad was actually employed by the Sanitarium Health Food Company when I was growing up. So, so I, I grew up um, actually spending my school holidays working in the Sanitarium Health Food Company. But um, no doubt, the, the way that we were brought up influenced my interest in nutrition. But as a researcher in a continent seven or 8,000 miles away, who most of the Adventist adherents have never heard of the Sanitarium Health Food Company in Australia and New Zealand. Uh, the relationship between the two is close to zero. Uh, but having said that, uh, I mean, scientists come up with hypotheses to test using data. Where did some of the hypotheses that I came up from uh, about vegetarianism? Of course, they had to do with my interest in the way that I was brought up. And um, it turns out that um, much of what we found was consistent with what we had been led to believe. Uh, 
but actually not all of it. And we've talked about uh, some of these things uh, this morning. So uh, as scientists, and uh, you know, we've published now about um, 300 peer-reviewed papers in the literature on the health of Adventists. Other people have published as well. There's a total of about 450. The peer review process is a tough process to get papers through. It's very hard for people who have strong biases in one direction of the other to get published in uh, modern scientific journals. So um, I can't really think that the thing that you were mentioning that we might be doing our research for some commercial advantage of a food company um, really would hold much uh, sway. Uh, and it, mm. how are your studies generally fu like funded financially? Yeah, the, our major studies have been funded by the National Institutes of Health. Um, we have had smaller amounts from the American Heart Association uh, and one or two other bodies, but I, I would say 90, 95%. Uh, and they've been expensive studies. I mean, there's been probably over the years about $40 million of uh, US government money that's uh, funded our work. I think that might surprise people. I think mm -hmm. a lot of people assume the church is funding a lot of the science that's being conducted on the Adventist populations. No. Church has funded zero. <laughs> Um, is it difficult for you you almost wear two hats here you know one is as a seventh day adventist the other is a scientist you know you are both that is a part of you is it difficult for you to wear the science hat and put forward like you did before what the data actually shows and and separate that perhaps from the more religious beliefs not really. Um, I mean, one has got to believe that a true religion is going to support science and science will support the religion. So I don't have any personal difficulty with that as, at all. I mean, in the minds of most people, and indeed there's truth associated with it, religions are not greatly concerned with objectivity and science supposedly is. Now, religions, uh, one would hope, has a certain amount of rationale, but the mere fact that we are studying a religious group, I think, does raise in people's minds questions of objectivity, and that's understandable. I understand that. But um, it's not been a, a problem, I, I don't think, for, for me personally. Um, what percentage of the scientists involved in the Seventh-day Adventist studies would be Seventh-day Adventists themselves or vegans or vegetarians? Yeah, um, about 80%, I would say, over the years. I mean, there's been a lot of people involved over the years, but we've had some moderately senior people who have um, not been Adventists, some Protestants, some Catholic, uh, who have been welcomed as part of the group. Um, most of us, I would say, are vegetarian or trend in that direction, but interestingly, none of us are vegan. <laughs> so uh, in papers that we have published, we got, you know, for instance, the, the dairy milk and breast and um, prostate cancer, um, we all had enjoyed dairy products to some extent. Uh, so it was not something that uh, we were... Um, measuring and coming up with, which made us feel particularly good. I mean, when I was a kid at school, I don't know whether how it was in Australia, but uh, the government provided us half pints of milk in school every morning, and uh, we drank it. It may not have helped my prostate many years later, I'm not sure, but uh, there it is. Um, so um, we you know, take the data for what it shows, and we've never really had a problem with uh, people having their favored lifestyle or diet um, having holes poked in it. Yeah. You mentioned before God as a, a kind of central part of religion or Seventh-day Adventism, um, God as a, a creator. How do you kind of square that with your science hat on and thinking about evolution? Mm. 
Well, um, you know, there's a lot of debate, I would say, within the church about that and different opinions. I don't think that question has ever had any impact on my uh, work and the rationale in my mind is why uh, we should favor a healthful uh, life. You can choose to think of God as a creator, or one may choose in many different ways. Um, even if you believe that God only put that spark of life in there many millions of years ago, as some people do, it was a remarkable thing he did. And uh, the idea that an architect of something like that should not have some interest in how things proceeded and how people therefore took care of the marvelous bodies that he was responsible for um, is, I think, a sensible idea. Uh, so that if you're a religious person and you believe in God uh, and that in some way he uh, created us, then it just makes sense to think that he should uh, probably be interested in how we treat his marvelous creation. I mean, I think that's the way that many Adventists would think of it, although um, officially Adventists think of creation in a particular way, but I don't think that's really terribly important to the rationale for our health message as a church. Right. Mm -hmm. So you're mm -hmm. kind of speaking to this idea that there could be diversity of opinions as to what creation means? Yeah, the details. That's right. But I, you know, I think that's irrelevant. If you think of that that God is responsible, uh, and indeed uh, life as we know it, and as we increasingly understand it, is just an amazing thing. Mm. What are the major criticisms that you've read or had presented to you with regards to the actual studies and the, the data itself? If, if there's going to be someone to kind of reject what you're putting forward and to say, no, I don't agree that a, a pesco vegetarian or a lacto over vegetarian diet is the optimal diet for longevity, what flaws or uh, aspects of your study design or data would they point to to kind of make that argument? Yeah. Well, the, the, um, the thing that's always stated, and it's correct, is that these are observational studies. But that, of course, is not unique to our studies. Any studies relating a complex lifestyle to chronic disease that takes decades to form, as we spoke of before, is going to be stuck with an observational study. And the question is to make the best of that in terms of being sure that you adjust for all the uh, other variables that might confuse and confound. So that's one thing that uh, we have to face in nutritional epidemiology, not in Adventism, uh, as studies of Adventists particularly. The, the other thing is that we nearly always have been asked to put in that this may not be representative of the population as a whole, because after all, we're studying a particular subset of the population. And that's true, but I actually think it's not a strong argument, because whether you study people from Framingham, Massachusetts, which is uh, a very famous study uh, historically, whether you study nurses, whether you study health conscious people in the United Kingdom, these are all different studies uh, that are well known studies, or whether you study Adventists, uh, they're all unique kinds of studies. But the commonality that they all have is we all have the same physiology, biochemistry, presumably responsiveness of lifestyle. Uh, um, at the cellular level. So it does seem to me that, yes, let's notice that there is uh, these potential issues with representation. But at the end of the day, I don't think it's uh, a very strong argument. And that uh, it is true, for instance, that 
the things we discover as risk factors for heart attack, diabetes, hypertension, body weight, blood cholesterol, even diet, um, are the same things that so many other studies of non-Adventists have uh, also found. So, you know, that just goes to make my point. Yeah, I don't mean to put you into the, the firing uh, seat, the hot seat, I should say, which I feel like I've, I've just done. But, uh, of course, I'm, I'm a big admirer uh, and believer in, in your scientific integrity and the work that you've done. And, and I agree. I think the fact that your findings have been reproduced in other populations supports that. We would be more wary if what you were seeing in Adventus wasn't corroborated by you know, other populations across the world um, and studies that are long-term observational, but also shorter-term studies looking at known risk factors and the way that diet influences them. So I think that reproducibility stands. It would be hard for people to, to argue against that. I think one thing someone might bring up specific to reproducibility here is the Epic Oxford vegetarian uh, cohort where the findings are a little bit different. But again, context matters. Why, why do you think the vegetarians in the Adventist cohort or pesco vegetarians, lacto-ovo vegetarians, uh, fare differently to vegetarians in the Epic Oxford uh, or British vegetarian cohorts? Yeah, it's a good question, and uh, you know we're good friends with the collaborate the uh, investigators over there, collaborating with them presently, actually. Um, and I, I think the the fact is that the vegetarian diet is scientifically not a uh, very cohesive kind of variable, if you like, to study. Um, it, it, there's a weakness in it that way scientifically, although there's a strength in it in that people can immediately understand it as to compared to some other diets. And by what I mean by the weaknesses that we define these diets by the consumption of meats, fish, dairy, and eggs, period. Now, what people might choose to eat outside of that leaves a tremendous amount of flexibility. So a vegetarian in Europe or in Asia or in India or in the United States can have really very different diets. And, uh, you know, I've lived for a year in the United Kingdom. Uh, the availability of fruits and vegetables and the variety of them there are different to here. The culture is different. Um, the uh, reports from some of the English studies do indicate that the vegetarians there eat vegetarian foods, but there's more processed food, kind of pies and puddings and things of that sort, which, of course, uh, that will vary a great deal, but on average. So, you know, the bottom line is that it's not at all surprising that studies that study vegetarians, quotes, in one part of the world shouldn't always find the same findings as vegetarians uh, in another. And uh, so one has to be uh, take notice of what are these people actually eating in terms of um, fruits and vegetables and nuts and legumes, and also to what extent are the foods they're eating, the vegetarian foods processed. Right, so the, mm. the type of vegetarian diet or the diet quality matters and when you've looked at the because i know you've looked at the nutrient status and intake um, typical intakes of the adventists across these different diet categories when you compare those to the vegetarians in the say epic oxford do we see big differences in things like fiber or other important nutrients that might explain that we do see some and uh, probably significant. And, uh, you know, the variables that perhaps most clearly define a vegetarian diet is the one that you mentioned is fiber, because fiber is only uh, present in vegetable uh, or plant foods. Uh, 
um, and the other would be some of the carotenoids. And in both of those variables, we do find fairly sizable differences in um, the reports from the two communities. So, you know, um, and uh, having said that, I mean, a lot of our findings are not so different, particularly in relation to um, cardiovascular disease, diabetes, BMI, body weight. Uh, they have found less effect on total mortality than we have. But, um, you know, our data is not marginal on that. The, the effects that we're finding um, are quite large. Uh, it depends also, to some extent, on the comparison group. Because, you see, you've got a group of vegetarians, but you're comparing them with something. And in the UK, the uh, comparison group might be different to the United States when we're comparing, for instance, Adventists to non-Adventists. Not so much when we compare Adventists of different kinds. But um, so, you know, I, I think that it's never been a surprise to us that there should be differences. Yeah. Mm. This kind of reminds me of a comment that I got on one of my recent YouTube episodes, and it speaks to diet quality. This comment was by the username fatter burrito which i thought was interesting but he or she said and thank you for commenting if you're listening i doubt they are a cheeseburger is not carnivore that's why i don't trust these studies people that are saying they're eating red meat and getting heart attacks are also eating cheeseburgers and other crap and so they're speaking directly here to to diet quality, and I guess that brings us back to to healthy user bias. But you know, just to reiterate this this point here, how are you making sure that something like red meat intake, for example, or animal food intake, is not also tracking with the consumption of you know quote unquote foods that we would call junk food? Yeah, no, a good point. Um, and of course, you know, healthy eating is one of the things we study. So we don't want to um, focus too much through that. But um, you know, we uh, we adjust for a lot of different variables. Um, so we know, for instance, that our vegetarians exercise just a little bit more than our non-vegetarians and we adjust for that um, and so we adjust for all those things we, we've also looked at specifically at processing uh, ultra processing and we find that there's about a 15 to 20 percent difference in mortality in Adventist diets that focus more on processed foods than those who uh, have much lower quantities of processed foods. And the interesting thing is that we find exactly the same thing and roughly the same risk, that 15 to 20 percent risk, whether we look among the vegetarians only or whether we look amongst the non-vegetarian Adventists. So, um, you know, what we are finding is that, yeah, there is a healthy diet bias and it's true within the vegetarians and within the non-vegetarians but the those who prefer less processed foods and who are vegetarian have much lower risk than the non-vegetarians who also prefer uh, unprocessed foods so the within both groups you've got that gradient but the two groups still remain separate. Right. So those yeah. earlier yeah. points we spoke about, yeah. about the the mortality, longevity advantages of a pesco-vegetarian and like to over-vegetarian diet, that's within the context of diet quality being accounted for. Uh, yes, although uh, it does turn out that in general, the diet quality of a vegetarian is uh, better than the diet quality of a non-vegetarian. So that's part of the definition of the diet in some ways. Mm. And um, that mm. difference in diet quality explains some of the 
the difference that you see in mortality? I think it does, yes. Right. Yeah. Which, which mm. then someone who, let's say, was arguing for a non-vegetarian mm. diet mm. here would say if the non-vegetarian subjects had a higher diet quality, you might not see a significant difference. Um, well, uh, you know, I think that's partially true. Uh, certainly, we continue to see a significant difference in cardiovascular disease. Um, it's not so clear in the other causes of death that we look at, uh, particularly it's not so clear in cancer. Uh, with the cancers, we're actually finding that it seems to be uh, perhaps more specific items like the milk that I've mentioned in the uh, prostate and breast cancers and red meats for sure, and particularly processed red meats for colorectal cancers. Uh, for other cancers, it's not yet as clear cut. We're finding, for instance, differences in mortality from pancreatic cancer and from lung cancer. And uh, we've not really had the opportunity yet to dig deeper into those to find what might be going on. Yeah, I, I briefly mm. read yeah. a paper of yours mm. that was looking at DNA methylation which is a bit of a, a mouthful. It might be a new term for some. It's not something that I've spoken about on this show before. What, it, what is DNA methylation? Why were you interested in, in looking at that? And you know, what was the you know, importance, if any at all, of the, the results that you found? Yeah, well, this was somewhat of a preliminary study um, because we only had DNA methylation at that time on about 100 people. Uh, what DNA methylation is, we, we each have roughly around 20,000 genes, but there's a, a great deal more in our DNA outside of genes that has to do with gene expression. And we don't understand too much about that now, but we do know that methyl group, groups in particular places through the DNA and the genome are one factor that controls the expression of these 20,000 genes. Um, and it turns out that there are probably several million of these places where DNA can attach. And currently, the kind of platforms that one can get if you submit uh, blood products for DNA methylation assay uh, will give us results in about 800,000 of these. And our published data it was more like 350,000. It was a few years ago. Um, and so you've got this kind of weird situation analytically that, you know, in our case, we had 100 people, which is a small group. But on each of those people, we had 800,000, or actually 350,000 on that group, um, variables and got results from. So we were interested in finding out, did the pattern of methylation of across the whole genome differ between vegans and non-vegetarian Adventists. And we found evidence uh, to support the fact that that was the case in all oh, nearly 10% of the methylation sites. Now, what that all means and the details of that are very unclear at the moment, but again, it's another indication that what we're seeing uh, behaviorally is having impact in terms of mechanisms and biology. Um, what are the other, I guess, major mechanisms that you think explain some of these health outcome results that you see where, you know, depending on the type of vegetarian dietary pattern, this kind of typical or consistent finding that lower risk of cardiometabolic disease, for example, what do you think are the main drivers of that or explanations from a mechanism point of view? I, you know, I think the main mechanism that we understand is uh, inflammation. Uh, inflammation we know is a, um, a potent factor, causal factor in cardiovascular disease. It's also a potent cause and factor in uh, many cancers. Um, another mechanism that we kind of suspect, but we've never had the opportunity yet to investigate in the way we should, is the whole possibility of autoimmune, autoimmune 
uh, problems that can affect and uh, affect inflammatory bowel disease, for instance, can affect different kinds of uh, arthritis, rheumatoid arthritis, um, and so forth. BMI also, you know, the major differences that we see in body weight I mean that can have influence on different kinds of arthritis and uh, diabetes. Uh, for instance, where we know that our vegetarians, as compared to our non-vegetarian advents, have only about one third the risk of diabetes, high blood pressure. Mm. Is that uh, after adjusting for BMI? Uh, yes, but uh, to a much more minor extent, BMI um, accounts for a great deal of that. In fact, uh, many people call adipose tissue the organ of inflammation. Uh, so it's probably all tied up with inflammation as well. Yeah, yeah I'm digging into yeah. the archives yeah. here, but yeah. I think I've read a paper probably one of yours given that you're you seem to be on pretty much every adventist paper that i read looking at lupus and its association uh, with dietary pattern within the adventist cohort yes yes that that's a uh, recent paper by well, one of my colleagues wrote and um it's it's um I think a hypothesis generating paper, it was a cross-sectional paper. In other words, we looked at the people who at the beginning of the study told us that they had lupus and it, there was quite a difference between the vegetarians, the rate, the proportion who had lupus and the non-vegetarians. Um, a stronger study, of course, is what we call a prospective study, but nevertheless, it's uh, very possible right. something's going on there. It's a starting and, uh, point, but that's, yeah. I guess, mm -hmm. similar in some ways to that fertility semen quality study we were talking about before with people presenting with a condition and then using that data as sort of one time point, but it may not be representative of the overall population is what you're saying. Well, it, it'll, it'll be representative of the population, but the big problem of cross-sectional studies is really reverse causality, potentially, kind of a chicken and egg kind of thing, which is probably unlikely. I mean, it's probably unlikely that the people who uh, have lupus suddenly all become non-vegetarians. Uh, see, that would be reverse causality. But that's the main issue with cross-sectional studies. I mean, this was representative of the vegans, you know, 10,000 of them that joined our study at the beginning, uh, the proportion who had lupus uh, was what we were able to estimate in the proportion of representative non-vegetarians. So I don't think representation is the issue there. Um, and in fact, uh, you know, it, it may well represent a, an underlying truth there, but it's not a study design that we usually consider to be the, you know, the best. Um, are there any other important outcomes that we haven't spoken about today that you've looked at where there has been a significant association between the type of diet in the Adventist population and whatever that, that outcome is? I think we've covered the field pretty well. Um, that, that's not to say that there's not a lot more questions to, to be uh, answered. Um, we're interested in um, you know, many other specific foods and nutrients uh, that we're actively you know, looking at, but we just haven't had the chance to uh, complete the analyses as yet. So it's one of the amazing things about diet. We've been studying it and many other groups for 50 or 60 years. So we still have relatively few, few answers, actually, that are considered totally trustworthy. Yeah, you, you mentioned before that there's some preliminary data on, the, on neurological conditions. So I'm sure many people will be um, anticipating or eagerly waiting for the publication of that. Are there any other kind of emerging results or papers that you've submitted that you can talk about at a high level at the moment? Well, actually, in part of that same paper, uh, something which is a little bit new, we seem to indicate that deaths that were related to infectious diseases were uh, less common in the, the vegetarians. And there's a number of possible reasons for that uh, that might have to do in part with uh, sugar consumption in the diets. Uh, we also found, in fact, the most striking 
result when we look at causes of death is that deaths from chronic renal failure were much, much lower in the vegetarians, only about one third and are highly significant, which is perhaps not a big surprise because the main causes of chronic renal failure are actually diabetes and high blood pressure. And both of those are much lower in the, in the vegetarians uh, as a whole. Yeah, there's a lot of shared risk factors across many of these lifestyle conditions. Did anyone analyze specifically outcomes from COVID infections? No, we, um, we were asked many times whether we could do that, but it turned out the way our study was organized and the fact that it was dispersed right across the United States made it very difficult to, to do that without major funding that uh, uh, we couldn't you know, quickly mm. get together. Have you yeah. seen the, the latest Danish dietary guidelines? I realize that's a funny question to ask. I have not, although uh, interestingly, I presented um, to that um, group six months ago. Tell me about them. Well, I think that they're mm. probably the most science-supported guidelines that I've seen. Oh, Health Canada's are also great. Yeah. Um, mm. There's some other contenders up there, but you know they are sort of explicitly stating now to eat plant-rich. Very much what you described before. They they rec they advise to consume fatty fish, um, low-fat dairy is in in their recommendation. Drink water for thirst. You know nuts and seeds, dark leafy greens, all these sorts of things. Whole grains over refined grains. Um, I think a very simple set of guidelines and a nice PDF for for people to kind of uh, refer to. But the 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 dairy recommendation low fat dairy it's not something we spoke about but do you have a preference for low versus full fat dairy and what would you say to someone who has just consumed a lot of information be it online or in books and um, you know is led to believe that dairy increases IGF-1 and that's just bad news plural yeah well it's interesting you should mention that because one thing we could do was pretty convincingly compare low fat and regular fat dairy and milk because we had a lot of people that you know uh, subscribed to either one of those, and so we looked at that very carefully. And the uh, this was was with respect to the prostate and breast cancers again. Uh, in both cases, we found virtually no difference in the increased risk whether the milk or the dairy was low fat or regular fat. It was pretty clear that the fat was not the bad guy we were looking at. Um, and it seems much more likely it's the protein. And that's interesting because it's that which is, I think, pretty well um, agreed on now is the active principle in raising IGF-1. Um, and it turns out that IGF-1 is also an acknowledged risk factor for both breast and prostate cancers. So they're just that could be another mechanism for the uh, activity of the dairy milk, but it's probably not the fat. Right. But it, it brings us back to that earlier point where we, we spoke about, you know, perhaps IGF-1 is increasing risk of prostate and breast cancer, but what's the net effect of IGF-1? What's the net effect of, of dairy? These people following the lacto over vegetarian diet seem to be doing pretty good. Is, it, is this a question of dose? Is this a question of you know, dairy affecting different risk factors in different ways, some positive, some negative? And it becomes hard to work out what the net effect is. Yeah. Well, well my, maybe I didn't express it clearly enough, but in our population – the lacto-ovos and the pescos and the non-vegetarians had exactly the same risk of both breast and prostate cancers. It was only the vegans that had the lower risk. So it kind of made sense. Right. It, but uh, the when it came to premature death, so death from all causes, yes. the yes. lacto-ovo vegetarians and the pesco vegetarians were the yes. only ones that had significantly lower risk, yes, right. not the vegans. So that's the point that I was – right. the distinguishing factor that I'm trying to make yeah. here or, or what yeah. I'm trying to just throw out there to workshop yeah. is, mm -hmm. is it possible that there is a food, in this case dairy, that is increasing risk of certain conditions – 
but at the same time is protective of other conditions and has a net positive effect on health at a specific dose or a specific type of that food, despite the negative effect it might have on a particular outcome. Yeah, I think that's entirely possible. And I mean, we see that um, in the dairy for, remember, the colorectal cancer had exactly the opposite effect as compared to the breast and the prostate cancer, because there the dairy appeared to be protective. We think it's due to calcium. And in fact, of course, it's very easy to get calcium from non-dairy sources. So for those that are vegetarians, that might make them feel better about that. But the idea that a food such as dairy could be a hazardous factor for one set of outcomes and protective for another appears to be entirely possible. And uh, of course, that makes it confusing. But uh, I don't think we've discovered a food much like that yet, except for the, uh, the, the what, I, what I've just mentioned. But um, theoretically, I mean, yeah, that's possible. And, you know, maybe, maybe we're seeing this in vegetarianism that that's not a food, but it's a diet pattern, that at least the stricter forms of it, that in the very elderly people are protective from some causes of death, but hazardous for others. So you, you get a partially compensating kind of situation. I guess mm. the public health recommendation, as the Danish Dietary Guidelines put it forward, they have the inclusion of um, dairy, and that's arguably because the outcomes seem to be neutral or, or positive. But on an individual level, if someone's just trying to run this analysis and make a calculation, is dairy a good addition to my diet or not, I would have to believe that perhaps other risk factors or like a family history of prostate or breast cancer, they might influence that decision. Yeah, yeah. No, that, that's exactly right. That's what I tell uh, people I speak to. It depends a little bit on family history and as you say, other risk factors. Uh, and, you know, these days, of course, we have some pretty good alternatives to dairy milk. And so it, it's easy enough to choose oat milk or almond or, or, or soy, um, which is actually what I do. I, I believe my own data. I no longer drink dairy milk, but I do have some cheese. God forbid you say soy on this show. I know that that will raise a few eyebrows, but I've dedicated entire episodes to soy, one with uh, Dr. Mark Messina, so people can go back and, and check that out if they want to deep dive all things soy before they freak out. Um, Big picture here, average American, they're going to make one change to their diet that is going to be the most significant driver for improved health, health span, longevity. What's that substitution or swap that they're making? Well, uh, that's a good question. Um, it's pretty hard to find one. Uh, I think I would probably have to say uh, meats, um, but of course even meats is a um, multifaceted kind of thing. There's several different kinds of meats, different kinds of red meats. But um, I think the evidence is pretty strong for a number of endpoints, cardiovascular, colorectal cancer, maybe some other cancers. And as much as anything else, the reason I choose that is that it's a fairly high calorie food and it's not so much always what you're not eating, it's what you're able to put in its place. And I think that if you can take meats from your diet but still get adequate protein plus all the other things that come from uh, you know, vegetables, fruits, nuts and legumes, that's a big change for the positive. So what would that swap look like? Would that be swapping red meat and chicken or... Uh, turkey, pork for fatty fish and legumes, or are we talking about what people might describe as mock meats? We haven't even spoken about mock meats, but I know they're part of the Adventist diet in some way. What does that substitution look like on someone's plate? Right. Well, uh, you know, from what we've already discussed, the, um, the fatty fish seems uh, a reasonable part of that swap. You've got a wide variety of choices. Either if you're a good cook, 
you there's a wide variety of things that you can craft together from good protein sources from vegetables whole grains nuts legumes or there is a wide variety of commercial products but the only thing i would say there is look carefully at the commercial products try and avoid those which are too heavily processed there are commercial products that inevitably combine all kinds of ingredients but there are those that the ingredients that they use are generally whole foods rather than bits and pieces and extracted this is and that and with all kinds of stuff left out. So be a little bit wise in the choices you make. But, um, you know, there, there are all kinds of meat analogs, as we call them, that are based on soy many times or nuts or, or whole grains, actually. Uh, and these days, peas as well and other uh, legumes. Yeah. yeah, and that mm. that idea of being cautious of some of those processed foods brings us back to what we were talking about before with the omega six and omega threes. And depending on someone's scenario, is that going to affect their DHA and, and EPA status? And when you take in all of this information, at least to me, it becomes clear why on a population level recommendations are like the Danish ones where they say to consume fatty fish and and dairy because there's less for people to think about. They don't have to think about supplementing with DHA or EPA, B12 maybe, depending on on how much of that stuff they're eating. But you can kind of see on a practical level why those guidelines are the way they are. And then, of course, when you consider the actual health outcome data, at least the data that, that you guys have published, it further supports that. Yeah, no, I, I would agree with that. I, I think uh, I think it's important to keep your recommendations pretty simple, and um, you know I think it's a weakness of some of the other good diets that have been proposed that they have kind of scoring systems, which the average person, if you can put together recommendations and three or four things that people can keep in their heads, uh, I think that's a big advantage. Looking forward, as a scientist that's been in this area of observational epidemiology and nutrition science for four decades now. Where do you see the field progressing to the advancements that are needed to fill in the blanks to give us more certainty? We spoke about certainty. That's what science is about, trying to move us closer to a truth and become more certain. How is the field going to achieve that? Well, I, I think there's a, a great need to supplement the epidemiologic data, which is you know, largely based on questionnaire information about diet with uh, more biological data. Um, many studies now, including our own to a relatively small extent, uh, are collecting biorepositories that you have blood samples and other samples from thousands of people. So you can look for mechanisms that support the idea that uh, certain diets that people tell you about are actually doing something biologically. So, So that's one thing that I think for sure is going to improve. And this high dimensional stuff that I mentioned, the DNA methylation, the metabolic uh, metabolome kind of data. I think we need to get a, a better understanding of how to take the hundreds and thousands of data points that you end up from there and try and collapse them to understandable chunks that are meaningful in terms of what's going on at the cellular level. The other thing that I think is really necessary is that there's been a huge focus on cardiovascular disease and cancer to a lesser extent, I guess, life expectancy and longevity, but much less focus on many of the less common but really important conditions that uh, interfere with people's quality of life and perhaps increase mortality. Uh, And that's understandable because they're a little bit less common It means they're more expensive, they're they're harder to gather adequate data from, but I I think there's a great deal to be learnt there, and I just hope that we can be part of that. That first point Mm -hmm. that you mentioned Mm -hmm. there about biomarker data Mm -hmm. reminds me of Walter Willett published a paper recently on red meat and diabetes, and within that paper, I thought this was really neat, they had this 
population where they had data on how people were eating from food frequency questionnaires. And then they had biomarker data, which is a way, uh, I guess, of corroborating <laughs> the food frequency questionnaire data. Does it line up? And then they were able to adjust at, a, at the large population level the food frequency questionnaire based on what they found in the biomarker data. And that strengthened, actually strengthened, not weakened the the results. So I think that, you know, as you say, is an interesting space. So hopefully we'll see more and more of these observational studies um, include in their analysis if they have the biomarker data. Yeah, that, that's right. And, you know, one of the things that we know as statisticians and mathematicians that when you have an error in what people tell you about what they eat, you would think somewhat naively it may be that there's a group of people who underestimate what they eat and there's another group who overestimate and therefore it would all balance out. It doesn't. The way that statistics work, errors in both directions tend to give results that minimize the appearance of risk. In other words, for those who um, understand relative risks, uh, you know, uh, one group is twice as likely to get it as the other group. It drives that truth of twice as likely to get it back towards a one which means they're equally likely to get it. And that effect can be major. So the errors in your data tend to drive it back to no significance. Difference. Right. So if there was less error, what you're saying, if there was greater accuracy in recall, then it would stand that some of the effect sizes we're seeing could be bigger than what we actually see in the data. Not the reverse, which is the argument that's made that food frequency questionnaires are not accurate, therefore we can't trust the effect size. Right. See, we've done something a little bit similar to what Walt did. We don't have as big a biorepository as him. So, But we do have a large group of people that gave us six 24-hour recalls of their diet, which are much more accurate, we think, than, and they, these six were scattered throughout a year. So we, we think that they give us much better data than the food frequency. Well, we could adjust the food frequency data by using those recalls. And when we did that, it roughly doubled the effect size, like it was about 1.3 um, comparing extremes of dairy intake for breast and, and prostate cancer with the milk again. When we did that other manipulation, adjusting, knowing the combined 24-hour recalls, the relative risk went up to 1.5, 1.6. So exactly as you said. Yeah. Let's finish here with a little bit of politics, government, public health. We should uh, we could call it. You're the Surgeon General, and based on everything that you understand from your studies, the broader literature looking at nutrition science and how different foods affect health outcomes, what would your recommendations be in order to help more people eat in a way that is consistent with the data? Yeah. Well, I'm, I'm far from a politician. So, um, but I mean, the things that we see, particularly in the United States, and of course, that's where I largely live now, but this is a very capitalistic society. The ability of large companies to make a good profit is uh, very important to the society here, I think much more so in Australia and New Zealand, for instance, but it's uh, obviously a big influence there as well. So it's very hard, even for a Surgeon General, I think, to put in place the kind of regulations that would be politically acceptable, which would be nevertheless good for the population. Uh, I mean, the amount of advertising that goes into um, foods which you know, nobody should be consuming. We had an interesting experience in the 1990s. As I mentioned before, we were one of the, well, the first uh, looked at nuts in relation to heart disease. The nut industry got pretty excited about that, as you can imagine. 
um, and uh, they wanted to use our data and other supporting data that's quickly came to pass to advertise nuts. It turned out that the hurdles in terms of policies and so forth to advertise a natural food were much higher than it took to advertise some dietary supplement for which there was absolutely no evidence at all. And that just makes no sense. Um, other things that I see that really need a lot of correcting here, and I don't know exactly politically how one could go about it, but the number of restaurants that will um, provide inexpensive food in mountainous quantities is obviously a huge problem for, for the society. I mean, I, I'm a cardiologist. The number of people I treat who are in the 300 to 400 pound range is a disaster. And uh, fortunately, we have some medications coming out these days which can help, but that doesn't make a lot of sense, does it? I mean, you, uh, you, 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 I suppose it makes sense to um, um, kind of companies, they uh, feed people up and then they charge them a lot for drugs to slim them down again. But uh, somehow none of that makes any sense. Yeah, it's not, um, it's not addressing the environment that's leading to the obesity in the first place. Well, Gary, thank you so much for joining us today and for your dedication to science. I think you should be really proud of your contribution. I've certainly admired your work from afar, but it was great to be able to have this opportunity to to sit down with with you today. So thanks for being willing to, to come and, and sharing with us. Well, thank you, Simon, for your work. There you have it, friends. I hope you enjoyed this episode. If you did and want to stay up to date with future episodes, be sure to hit that subscribe button on YouTube and follow on Apple or Spotify. Finally, thank you for showing up and the effort that you're making to take control of your health. I look forward to hanging out with you again in the next episode.